So we're back on Super Progressive, and today we're extremely excited with our guest. Uh, we're coming in remote, but we're live from the Super Progressive studio with Sonder Kleinenberg. Welcome, my friend. Thanks, man. Good to, uh, to be here and thankful for the opportunity. Yeah, well, we're just super stoked. Um, how have you been the past couple of, me- uh, couple of weeks? What's been up? Well, the uh, last couple of weeks, I've been uh, preparing my uh, upcoming wedding, which is going to take place in, in two weeks. And um, I, I stepped into this process thinking, I've done a few parties in my life. <laughs> I've organized a few raves. How hard can it be? Um, but then the whole sort of Pandora's box of organizing a wedding opened. And uh, let's just say I'm happy I'm still alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not yet broke, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's coming. Um, no, it's been, it's been super exciting. It's just been, it's been crazy, crazy busy. But uh, but good 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 type of busy but crazy busy. Did I mention crazy busy? <laughs> yeah, um, you've been traveling a lot, as we can see on your Instagram. Yeah, no, and also yeah, we you know we, there, there's a bunch of businesses that that I'm involved in, and and obviously as these things go, uh, September is quite a busy month for some of those some of those businesses, and and so the last couple of weeks have been really crazy. Yeah, definitely. Well. Uh, it, it sounds like you could not be busier. So thank you for taking the time to speak with no, us. No, totally <laughs> fine. I like the fact that you guys are in LA. So in the Netherlands, in Europe, things are like slowing down. It's now nine o'clock. I can go into my second wind. I'm, I'm good. You know? Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, we're like noon here. And thankfully, the construction all around us has kind of mellowed out. So we lucked out. But um, let's get into it. We're, we're really excited to kind of learn from your experience. Um, so I have your new breed album notes right here. And the first thing I learned about you was that you grew up in a town called Almelo, which was in the east of, or in the eastern part of Holland. Now, you said that when you were a kid, not a lot of people um, thought DJing could be a career at all. So my question to you is, what was kind of your first interactions with house music and can like we know today uh amsterdam to be like one of the epicenters of the house music scene and underground dance music but what was the scene like uh at the time when you were coming up learning about house music for the first time um so the one the one thing we have in the netherlands which is really amazing um specifically back then it's a bit different now was public radio and public radio um, had at its core the task to inform uh, its listeners about, you know, the world and what was going on musically, culturally, uh, any vibe, any direction, any subculture, uh, w- you know, had to be featured or was featured by people that were um, interested in culture and not specifically interested in how many people listen to the radio stations because there were three radio stations, so there are bound to be some people listening. <laughs> and uh, this sort of uh, open cultural um, vibe, this like sort of like um, sort of radio that sort of gave you a glimpse into what was going on in the world, gave me, you know, my first sort of bleeps of underground dance music uh, back in the mid 80s. I think I was like 13, 14 years old. There was a Thursday night mix show called The Soul Show, which was um, a DJ called Ferry Matt. uh, And he played, you know, dance music from the dance floors of New York and Chicago and 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 so on. Um, And he played a lot of R&B and sort of by the late 80s, 88, 87, he also started playing a little thing called New Beat, which is like a Belgium um, sort of start of house music, at least in, in, the, in Belgium, a bunch of producers in Belgium so, sort of doing this industrial vibe um, with simple lyrics and simple shout outs, some drug references, some, some mad shit, some, some space, some, you know, some uh, galactic, uh, galactic uh, beaming and obviously craft work and all, the, you know, all these you know, German bands that were 
so important back then in, in, in Europe. And so that mixed with, um, with American R&B and that all put together gave me this sort of like, oh my God, this is, this is so exciting. This is like, you know, it's like an alien beef, some, some foreign distant planet like calling me. And uh, I was obsessed. Like all my peers were like chasing girls and I was glued to the radio, recorded on a cassette, all these mix shows and then, you know, played the hottest records over and over again during the week and wait it until the next Thursday, you know, there'll be another show and there'll be another and new records and fresh records. And every night at 8.30 on that show, there was something called, in the Netherlands, it's called Driemal Dordrai, which basically means something like, um, I don't know, like the, the, the 20, 30, you know, the, the half past eight sort of mix. Um, and it was a mix done by DJs that would uh, send these mixes to this, to this, to this mix show, to this, to this show. Uh, and it would be like 20 minutes of records mixed together. And to me, that was, it was the, the, that was it. It was the end, the end, you know, I thought it was just the coolest vibe. And um, so that was really my first sort of glimpse into electronic music, house music, night culture, nightclubs, um, you know, black music meeting, European industrial music. It was really the time. I didn't know what it was, obviously, because it was like still in development, but it was definitely the first sort of branches of this new vibe, you know, this new thing. And I, you know, I came from hip hop and I, I, I did graffiti and I scratched a little bit. Turntablism was like still an infant, but it was like, it was there. And it's like, and all that stuff sort of like happened in the late eighties. Then I started DJing at a club where I've, then for the next sort of six years, I was battling with most owners about how much of this new music I could play <laughs> because they, they wanted to hear the top 40 stuff. And they said, OK, well, you know, I'll give you 15 minutes to play that oomph music, you know, 15 minutes. And then I had like from the 500 people that go there, there was like three people that were into it. And slowly but surely, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um of those, you know, so you must have been building some sort of record collection of the time. How were you coming into contacts, into contact with these records? Often we hear about these like special relationships between DJs and record stores and how that's kind of a glimpse into the scene. Um, how were you getting some of these early records and who were some of the first DJs that left an impression on you? So the, those are two different questions, but I'll start with the record store. Um, a hundred percent. If you are a little kid from, in this, in my case, the east of the Netherlands, and you would go to the, I don't know, maybe the 10 specialist record stores that were around that would sell this type of music, uh, you would be at the back of the, at the back of the line. And then by the time you, you know, would hear like the newest records, like most of them, white labels were, were already given out to the, you know, the more important DJs. So this whole thing was like a, it's like, I don't know, I guess it's like standing at the high half pipe and then you've learned your trick on your own all the time, all the time. And you're waiting for that moment where, I don't know, Tony Hawk goes like, okay, you know, show me a trick, you know? And, and that's exactly how it went back in those days with the culture around uh, record stores, you know? You knew like, okay, it's Thursday. Thursday is the day when the new releases come to the store and you go to the store at three in the afternoon and then you meet your heroes and you meet some people and you're like, oh my God, that's Dimitri. Oh my God, that's Remy. Or, you know, there's like people there or even visiting DJs later on, visiting DJs from Detroit and Chicago, Amsterdam, as you pointed out, had and has a strong link and a strong place in the hearts and minds of the birth of, of, of electronic music and the bringing the, the Detroit elite and the New York elite to uh, Amsterdam was like, you know, so you could see Derek May in the wild and be like, oh my God, let's like, there he is, you know, the, the God of techno. Um, and then the second thing is like the first DJ that got me into DJing was, the first DJ I ever heard DJing was a DJ called Westbam. He is from Berlin. He's actually the founder of the Love Parade um had a bunch of hit records uh in the 90s he's a huge rave dj in uh, in germany and he dj'd at a club that i played at uh just over the border in germany the east of the netherlands is bordered to germany and i, I played at the time um at a club in germany where a lot of dutch kids would go to because the alcohol laws were not so strict and like people would visit the um, you know germany from from the netherlands also as an experience like i'm going out in germany was kind of cool thing to do so um so there i saw a, a west Bam, and uh, it was the first dj i saw that 
that just played dance music and didn't play any any other uh, music or top 40 music, but just like an hour of, of that music. And I remember that the whole club kind of looked at it like, what what's going on? Like, why is he not like talking through the, you know, through the records? Like, what, what's this thing? And he's mixing the records together. And yeah, it was kind of confusing, but I just, I guess I, I saw uh, a light which 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 has been inspiring until today and um but i mean there's you know from the netherlands later on there's you know pioneers in the netherlands like dj dimitri and uh and remy and marcelo those three were like the club kings of the netherlands in the early 90s and they were to me like you know the ones that i looked up to and, and you know inspired me definitely um so one thing we learned from our talk with paul oakenfold was um, back closer to the birth of club music culture and underground music, that DJs and producers were actually way more two separate jobs than they're kind of combined into one uh, like we see today. How did you make the decision to take this passion for mixing and start uh, producing your own music? Or was it the other way around where you were producing music first and then found mixing? I mean, to be honest, like... I don't know what Paul said about this, but to me, um, the two always had lived together. If I look at my hero heroes, uh, like, um, I don't know, like, uh, Larry Levon or, um, um, forgot his name, the producer of Madonna that produced holiday, um, John Jellybean Benitez. He, you know, th those are all like club, D New York club DJs that took the club and then, record labels realize like hey you know if we if we get this dj to remix the record then he can translate what he feels every saturday into that record and maybe you know if this dj would play in like a hot club like limelight or paradise garage or any of those like places where people would li literally go to to listen to new to hear new music um these a and r's were smart enough to think like yeah let's let's just appoint this guy to you know to to remix so i guess i guess the dj uh, was initially more s someone who would remix. I, th I think that's that's a closer relationship, specifically in the in the early days. And I think producing, um, I mean, that to define producing as well is such a the, the lines are so blurred because we say, yeah, you know, a DJ produces a record, but you could also say today, like a DJ is the artist and he uses producers, you know, to to help shape his sound. You know, I think that's a you know far um easier or or better way to describe what you know what has happened to dj culture and the whole journey of sort of the dj being the guy in the club sort of dictating the dance floor and then then, then saturday night between 12 and 5 is his territory into david Guetta has been has been an incredible uh shift and an incredible journey obviously a journey that i believed in and i thought it would end up happening i thought the dj was so versatile and was somebody so easy to market that you know um it was inevitable that you know the dj would end up becoming michael jackson so so but in that journey there's been a lot of stages and a lot of moments where you can question like what was the role of the dj what was his uh, you know what was his you know position how how could we call him um so the dj producer i mean yeah mark ronson is a dj producer but i think I don't know, maybe we can name some other people where it's like, not sure, it's a blurred line. What, what is he, you know, is he a performer or a DJ or a producer or, or a mixer or somebody who just gives vibes? It's like, is Diplo a producer? I'm, you know, yeah, maybe, but he's also somebody who gives like direction and like brings a vibe and has a really great taste in music, you know? And I think all these things put together, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's difficult to define and each, where each sort of, barrier was crossed like you know but it started for sure as it's, it's in the it's it's you know it, it was born in the club you know that, that that that's where it stems from definitely it sounds like the word that is used a lot today professionally across all industries is curation well, yeah i mean 100 percent. that that is what it's all about like i think a great dj is somebody who is simply somebody who curates really well you know who goes through the fucking 10,000 records and goes like, okay, here's 20 that I think are pretty good, you know, and I'm going to put them together like this, you know, the journey and the, the storytelling and everything that comes with it, 
that's all amazing but it starts with that sort of like you know my mom and dad used to tell me like your your gigs are not the job it's the it, you know it's i it's the going to the gig that's a big part of your job but it's also the the managing that sort of like um those three four hours of freshness you know that 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 just needs all that sort of dedication to weed through all the nonsense to sort of reap you know the the fruit totally i want to i want to talk about the early days of you as a professional can you kind of explain some of the relationships that were key let's say that got you to the point of you do me wrong in 1996 like your initial ascension um as someone in the scene i mean absolutely i i um so i made those first steps you know the radio was important then i slowly made some waves in in the local club scene uh, which was a battle in the late 80s you know because it like I said before, the electronic music, my passion was not really widespread. So it was a real sort of like uh, pilgrimage to, to, you know, get people to, on board. And then in the early 90s, I met a guy called Ricky the Dragon. And uh, he was a producer based out of Rotterdam. Uh, and he had released records on a, on a, on a le legendary uh, Dutch label called Stealth Records. Um, and he came into, into my town for whatever reason. I have no idea. Maybe he was running away from from the tax authority or I, I don't know why, but he ended up in, 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 in Omelo. Um, and he had an MPC 60. And uh, t this was like, I mean, I was like, oh my God, because you got to remember like back then you, you needed fairly expensive gear to, you know, start producing. And obviously you needed to invest in a setup and all that. And it's not easy if you just bought your, you, it was like a choice. Like, am I going to buy the 1200s, the Technique 1200 turntable, or am I going to buy a, a sampler? It's like, okay, well, let me get the 1200s first and then, you know, save up for two years and then maybe this or that. And then he came in town and he had an MPC 60 and he was so good with it. He was like, he, he was fast and he, you know, it's not an easy machine to operate. It's not an easy machine to, to program. Um, but he was, I don't know, he was open to um to be like a mentor and i think i guess if i look back he was my first mentor he uh he gave me a ride on that mpc he, he let me sort of touch it let me sort of feel and understand um the, the, how to program it and uh, i remember the first thing he told me was like okay you know i can i can tutor you somewhat but first what you're gonna do is you're gonna you're gonna wash my car and um, to the to to this day, I remember that sort of like okay, so you you want to go somewhere, you start with the dirty job and the sort of like you know, and it was like this whole he he made it into quite a if I say religious, it's that's maybe a bit big, but he he made it into like if you are ready to operate this, there is a there's a responsibility and there's a um, there's a, a way of of dealing with this with this energy. Uh, that requires um, commitment and it requires uh, some sort of sacrifice. So, and he was like, before you're there, you have to do this. So, you know, it was really good. I remember it till, till today. Maybe I'm romanticizing. It's been, it's been a while, but it's like, obviously this, this path has brought me uh, quite a long, long way. So, so looking back, that was, that was a really first step into this crazy ride and this, this crazy energy that, uh, that I was uh, and uh, that I am a part of. Yeah. Definitely. Um, it's cool though. I mean, you say romanticizing, but it's like, those are the experiences that stick with you and kind of provide a framework for how you're going to go about building your career um, in this, in this industry. So I think that's a really cool story that you just shared. No, sure. For sure. And it's like, I look at some elements now and it's like, um, I don't want to be the old guy that goes like, it's important to have these sort of stepping stones into becoming who you are and to come to real fruition, you do need those fundaments. And even if it's just a little while, it's like, I'm not saying that everybody should suffer for art. You know, that's not, that's not what I'm saying, but it's, it's good to have that sort of embedded into your fundaments, the sort of the, the knowledge of understanding where you're coming from, understanding who came before you. Um, I think, I think to truly navigate that world it's important to know these elements because otherwise it gets treacherous and you may become less humble and and this road is is can you can only walk this road if you're if you're if you're humble you know so the i'm gonna stick i'm gonna like skip a little bit ahead to the specific story because i heard it in one of your interviews and it really was unique to me but you have a track you do me wrong 
that comes out is released in 1996. Correct. And this track is successful in its own right, but you later on learned uh, that it had its own completely different ascension in life in New York because Junior Vasquez was mixing it back to back at each of his gigs. For yeah. a whole year. For a whole for a whole year, apparently. It could that that was I mean, to be honest, like looking back at it now, it's such um let me let me let me rewind a few years because 92 is when my first record came out. Um cool. and it was through Ricky and this MPC 60 that I just uh, touched upon. Um, and then slowly, you know, I made some other steps. I moved out of Almelo to The Hague, um, uh, somewhere around 93. And in The Hague, I connected with more like-minded people. And obviously this industry grew uh, a little bit and normalized a little bit. And, um, and it was enough for me to sort of take that sort of risk where I was like, okay, I, I effed up everything, school, whatever. I have nothing, no social life, no whatever. This is my only uh, passion, a couple of hundred uh, vinyls and the sort of dream to, yeah, to become a traveling DJ and to, to you know, become a part of this culture in a, in, in a relevant way. And um, so I started releasing the records. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that in and around 95, 96, um, I hit a sort, of, a sort of peak of my first sort of wave of, of, of of development and, and trying and obviously failing and then trying again and failing again and trying again and failing again until that moment where I released that record. And it was so weird because like um, having pop success or something on the radio will give you obviously instant gratification. It's like, oh yeah, of course, you know, it's on the radio. I am somebody, you know, and, but this was like an international uh, club hit. And it's like, I had no idea. I mean, I knew we were selling 5,000 copies or 10,000 copies, but I had no idea what it, would, what it actually meant, you know, to have that type of um, effect on the world. I mean, I knew what happened when I got like a record um, that was by some, you know, new kid from somewhere and you read the, 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 the credits and you go like, oh, this is amazing. This is guys called Pizarro. He's from Italy. He's incredible. Or this is Kenny Dope Gonzalez. Gonzalez uh, and this is Masters, Masters at Work or Daft Punk or whatever. It's like, it was like a whole, um, the way you got that information, looked at the record sleeve, how cool are they? You know, can, can, I, can I get some info from this? Often there were like fax numbers on the on the promos or fax numbers on the you know you 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 you, sometimes you you dare to fax them go hey can you send me a promo whatever so this is like early days of communication with a world that was like literally still very difficult to navigate because you know you couldn't get there by zoom or you couldn't get there by whatever you had to go there either physically to experience what a record would do in a place like new york or la or berlin it was just hearsay or you would maybe potentially a month later read some top 10 by a local DJ and you go like, okay, so apparently this did something. But what it did, no idea. There's no YouTube to check out, you know, the limelight at three in the morning. <laughs> it didn't exist. Before we kind of jump in and move forward with the, um, you know, with the GU era of your career, I just want to stop at, you, you talked about The Hague. And this is one thing that I kind of found in comments of your tracks on Instagram or on YouTube rather. And just in the comments, fans of yours always talking about The Hague. There's not a lot written about it on the internet that I found the history of. Did you hold a residency there? Or like, why why do people look to this club as kind of uh, an important place? Because I'm totally in the dark. No, okay. Well, The Hague is a city, first of all. Oh, see, that's my apologies to everyone there. Like... I don't mean to come off as uncultured or something. It's just, yeah. It's good, man. It's the political capital of the Netherlands, but that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, yeah. Oh my god. And I like think I'm like I think I'm like a decently smart guy. Like that's pathetic. No, no, no. It's okay. It's LA. You you go to bed. We we where we wake up. So it's cool, man. It's like you may have missed this part of the world for a bit, but no. So so it's the political capital of the Netherlands, and um um, it has a. From origin, it has had a very strong uh, uh, pop scene. Um, a lot of really famous bands uh, that ended up going all over the world. Like uh, you could find uh, the Golden Earring or Shocking Blue. Um, they they are world renowned. Like Golden Earring, Radar Love is like a you know a, one of the hundred biggest rock songs in the history of rock. 
um, even according to you guys in America. But um, so they're from the Hague. <laughs> they're from the Hague. Um, so the Hague is a really, really healthy uh, um, pop, pop, pop um, scene, um, and also in the DJ scene, um, obviously as a, as a, um, I guess as a re reflection of the the pop scene, also it emerged fairly early uh, with 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 a healthy dose of talent and uh, and I guess infrastructure, you know, so. It had a lot of really good uh, music stores, uh, 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 stores where you could buy gear, um, um, uh, knowledge, you know, local knowledge that uh, studios, uh, uh, you know, uh, record stores. Uh, so really healthy. But the mentality in The Hague, uh, un uh, unlike uh, Rotterdam and Am specifically Amsterdam, is in The Hague, they, de they don't give you credit until you get like a Grammy on your, uh, you know, on your nightstand. Cause that's like, cause there's a bunch of people from The Hague, which is a small city. There's only a couple of hundred thousand people, but some of them made like fucking huge rec records. Like uh, Shocking Blue is, um, what's it? Venus, I'm your Venus, I'm your fire, it's pure desire. It's like, you know, obviously um, a world renowned record anyway. so. So um, the Hague uh, was important to me to to because I moved there and 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 then and then my career furthered there and my record label was there and I started a record uh, uh, label myself in the Hague um, and really honestly the progressive music scene uh, was born I could really honestly say it was born for the Netherlands it was it was mostly born in the Hague so you had a DJ called Remy that was extremely important. Um, he played a mix of techno and trance, but like really in a sweet spot. Um, labels like Deal Records um, that were like picked up by Sasha. Um, just a quick detour. I just got a one of my favorite DJs. Current DJs is called Ross from France. I think he's fucking like an amazing. He skates. Do you skateboard? Yeah. Do, do you skateboard? What's that? What's that? Do, do you skateboard? You like skateboarding. You were talking about Tony Hawk earlier. I love that. I love the subculture. The sort of like, I feel like skateboarding is such a, it has so much to do with DJing and, and graffiti and hip hop. And I was like, you, you all know, like you pick your, you know, I could have easily yeah. been a skater, but I choose. I, I love skateboarding too. It's like my favorite subculture as well. I think there's so much similarities between skating subculture and DJ. The whole thing, like everything. So it's like, there's no, there's no question. Um, Funny that you say that, actually, because I would love to go back to that, because culture in general is like what sort of defines all of this, I feel. Uh, and OK, I happen to be coming a DJ that like became famous through Progressive House, but the whole thing comes from from street culture, you know, and, and skating is obviously such a huge element of street culture. So but going back to uh, The Hague and, and Progressive House, so so Remy, Deal Records, um, the clubs, Exposure, uh, Asta, they were like yeah they were like breeding grounds for 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 the oh yeah i was actually saying something about ross from france so he played he he, he did a mix show like a, a few months ago and all of a sudden i'm listening and i'm hearing a record i did uh the record i did pre you do me wrong was called conflict and he plays this record i think conflicts to me was probably my first st step into uh full-on progressive house uh chords, bass lines, the whole thing was like 100% progressive house. And, and he, he played it like, just like a few months ago in his set. So I was like, what the fuck is this? Like my favorite DJ is playing a record that, that I did like 25 years ago. It's, it was like the, the wildest sort of like, well, here you go. Here's a little thing you did, you know, in the past. And it comes back to you through, you know, somebody you, you admire. Anyway, um, so, but The Hague is a, is a breeding ground for progressive house. I think in, in, in Amsterdam, they were all a little bit more sexy, a little bit more house oriented, a little bit more uh, Chicago, a little bit more like that. And then, and then Rotterdam was m way techno, fucking like 100% Detroit, like you know, Gabba, like hard, like like industrial. And then the Hague, I guess you know, we we're just like really in that sort of middle, you know, we're literally in the middle. But it's like we we. Yeah, we got fed by these two sounds and then yeah this came out and, and then i later found out that if you listen to old sets from sasha at shelley's and he played all these records you know and i always thought like up to the moment that we met and then the birth of progressive house in the way that we know it in the global underground that that was my first sort of 
way into Sasha's DJ box. Um, uh, but apparently, you know, it had already happened five years before and it may as well been that he was the one looking into the credits on records and go like, oh, this dude, Sam McClanahan, I know him, you know? And so, but all these connections where now it's like, you get these connections within like a second because if somebody plays something and it's online, you see that that guy plays some, but back then it's like, there was no like digital catalog or backlog of, of what people did around the world. It was just like, yeah, I'm selling these records, but who to, I have no idea. There's no, there's no hardly any track records, you know? So um, yeah, it's interesting to see that the Hague was, uh, was, was an important stepping stone for, for progressive house music. Paco and Frederick, uh, yeah, like I said, Remy and, 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 and me, I guess, and Steph, Steph Froelich. Um, yeah, it's cool. It, it's really cool. Thank you for teaching us about that because one of my favorite things, just like with skating, it's the same with house music. You can go and travel and see these places that to the mass majority of people mean one thing. But if you're a dedicated fan of this sub community, uh, locations and certain buildings hold completely different uh, meaning and understanding. So like eventually visiting a place like the Hague in the future, I'm super excited about because of now I'm, I know about its history with house music and stuff like that. No, it, a hundred, it, it, this specifically, like I said, for progressive house, it was, uh, yeah, it was important. It was definitely important. It's it was cool. good to be there. It was, it was the, the birth of it. It was, yeah. We live like a mile from the Hollywood high school, uh, 16 stair that like is featured in every single skate video. And it's cool being able to walk by something like that and know that, it is really like one of the wonders of the world to to a small culture, but to everyone else, it's just their school stairs. But yeah, no, it's cool. L let me tell you a story. It's, it's interesting you say this about the birth of culture. Um, so I, I love Los Angeles and 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 um, pre pandemic or pre P as we call it. <laughs> um, I used to go quite a bit, um, and uh, I remember one day we we went to Malibu, which is, which is I love Malibu and the beach specifically and you know we went we hung out and we were hanging out uh, uh, uh near the 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 life watch tower and one of the um uh lifeguards came you know came came down and i was taking pictures of Nora. and i guess this is like maybe it's like eight years ago something like that seven years ago uh, um and you know i'm <laughs> i'm giving him the phone i'm like hey dude can do you can you think you can make a picture of me and my girls, you know, so for, you know, for home, whatever. And he said, oh, I'm sure it's for the gram. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, the gram, like Instagram. It's probably for the gram, right? I'm like, yeah, it's for the gram. Fuck, this is the coolest way of saying Instagram, like ever. And, and it's just like a fucking surf dude. And he's in the middle of culture and he's in, in, the, in the middle of like all that stuff. And he, and he tells me, you know, so I come home and I'm like, yeah, it's cool. You know, we were running around Malibu, did some stuff for the gram and, you know, <laughs> and it's like, that's how it, and that's how, it, how, how, uh, how, it, how, it, how you give birth to culture, right? You are in the middle of where, I mean, obviously a lifeguard in LA is going to find, find an easier way to say Instagram. Who else? Like, it's either a skater or some fucking lifeguard or, you know, somebody who's like, I, I cannot say Instagram. It's really, I call it the gram. So just trying to sort of like um, explain like the birth of culture and how you're so, so right. How integrate these elements are that give birth to, um, to language and to culture and to ideas and to the way we, we you know, we are shaped. And I think with house music and being a part of it and seeing it grown and becoming the worldwide phenomena has been such a, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been a, on par with like how I've seen the world sort of like slowly coming closer to together and how uh, smaller um, and shorter the culture travels, you know, and culture, you know, like I said, eight years ago, it was like the gram and then, okay, I needed to go into an airplane and then use that cool world word to, to also be cool in, a month later in some situation where somebody in the Netherlands went like, oh, the gram, that's cool. I'm going to use that as well. So like I said, it's like, um, 
that's that's how how it happened in house music as well. You know, that's that's how these little you know little um, elements traveled the world and how suppressed uh, gay culture <laughs> became the world's dominant culture. You know. Yeah. I, and I think like one thing you say about doing it for the gram, it's like, that's just a saying, but in terms of culture, it also shows that it's something that you have to put time and work to because we know firsthand content curation. And you must also know, cause I watched the vlogs. It's not easy. Like some, like in terms of if your work revolves around Instagram, it's a lot of hours and it's, it's not easy work. No, I mean, but that's with everything. It's the same, like, you know, and, and it's funny to see because, uh, you know, my wife is, is a big Instagram, uh, in, you know, individual. And, and having seen her digital disruptive journey has so much similarity with, uh, with DJ culture. And I remember back in 88, everybody's like, oh, DJing, what the fuck is DJ? You play a couple of records, this and that, you know, and it's like, oh, dude, do I have to explain what I actually do? Like, I go through 4,000 records to play these 10 that are given to you by me, uh, you know, so you can feel like a god. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some credit on your ecstasy pill, you know? Give me some some credit. But uh, it's the same with, the, you know, with 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 what we do with with social media. It's like, People just go like, oh, how hard can it be? You take a picture of the Eiffel Tower. I'm like, dude, like, I don't know, man. I have 40,000 pictures of the Eiffel Tower in my phone. And there's only nine that we uploaded. That's kind of like what we do. It's the same. It's like, it's weeding yeah. through and like curating, like you said. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's awesome. Um, so let's let's bring it to the G era, if you're cool with that. Of you course. Know? Yeah, no, I mean, th th I can talk you into it. It's like... Yeah, like... I'm like, feel like I'm jumping around. Can you talk us into it a little? Yeah, no, I mean, do you, if we go chronological, like 96, SNS, you do me wrong. It's like, wow, these clubs around me are popping. All of a sudden, I'm being booked for the records that I make. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's a dude that had a record on Strictly Rhythm. All of a sudden, I'm booked in, I don't know, like Hamburg and, and Paris. And I can, I can slowly, these doors are opening uh, to, to, to the world. And of course, I drove to Paris and then the promoter was nowhere to be found. And of course, uh, I never got paid for a gig in Hamburg. And of course, all these struggles and trying to, uh, you know, make it in the world and all those sort of pitfalls and whatever, they all happened. But in 2000, uh, I guess the world had moved on further. Uh, cell phones were doing its introduction. Uh, my mom and dad, my mom and dad stopped paying the international phone bills to do my <laughs> to do my business around the world um so i had to do it myself so yeah it's like i mean i guess i you know i grew up and and um and progressive house was i mean honestly seriously when when those renaissance uh, mix albums were released and those first mix albums by by sasha and john were released and the influence that they that these compilations had was obviously like it was like um a real next level of professionalism of 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 branding the DJ, um, you know, m magazines in 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 the UK, music magazine, uh, mix mag, uh, DJ. There were like, like slowly, it was like it was obvious, like the DJ became um, a real hero, a real modern day fucking rock and roll fucking hero, you know, and uh, and with that came the adoration and the sort of like the whole sort of like. The, the creation of that personality and the myths that came with it and how that sort of started traveling the world through obviously new media. Uh, yeah, it was, was, was just breathtaking. It was, it was inspiring and, and you wanted to be a part of it. Uh, um, I then had become uh, a curator for, uh, for a club. I was a DJ, you know, resident DJ at a club in the Hague. Um, and it's first month of opening they asked me you know i was in charge of creating the lineup and i was like i have to book sasha i have to you know i have to book him i mean he has to come it, it was uh i guess it was 99 and um and i book him through for christmas but i book him between boxing day which is the 26th of december uh I, I, and, and New Year's Eve because I had her, his agent on the, on the phone. Her name is Tara uh, and the agency was called, um, I want to say it was called Accession, but I think, I think it was pre, 
uh, accession. It was called something else. Not too sure. I think Lee Burridge coming back from Hong Kong had started that agency. I think it was called actually it was called Tyrant because Tyrant was Lee Burridge and the other guy, uh, Crack, Ooh, Crack something. Okay, I forgot his name. Anyway, so um, Tara called me. I called Tara like, hey, Tara, I'm so and such. I'm from the Netherlands. I want to book Sasha. And she was like, no, it's impossible. He's fully booked. I'm like, well, what if we try something like in between New Year's Eve and Christmas? And she was like, well, we could try the 27th, but are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm sure. I think that fell on a Friday or something, or, you know, some a day that I could do something, which was suicide because like who fucking organizes a party between Christmas and New Year's Eve? But I was like, fuck it. I have to have to book this guy. I want to, you know, I want to have this energy in this club. Um, so it was the first international or one of the first international DJs that I booked that I had to fly in from somewhere else and like I had to pick up from the airport and then sort of like take to the club and organize. So I had to organize a hotel room of like, dude, like a hotel, what, what hotel does a man like this stay in? You know, so all these like sort of like variables that are now so fucking logical and it's like a whole industry was we're then like, okay, how do I, how do I, how do I do this? You know, what, what, what how's, what's the, what's the, and I think, I don't know, I paid him 5,000 Dutch guilders, which was pre-Euro. So it's like uh, we paid each other with our local currency back then instead of the, you know, European money. And um, I remember standing at, at the airport and then uh, I thought, yeah, no cell phone. Like I had no idea like who to call, whatever. He just had to show up, right? Like, and I stood there and I'm like, what do I look at? I'm obviously going to look out for a guy with a fucking bunch of bu box of records. And I think he was... Oh, he was he was uh, he was he was a little rough around the edges because he had partied for quite a bit. It was, I mean, if I say that he probably missed like three flights before he actually got on that flight where we picked him up, it's probably true, uh, in true Sasha style. And um, we hit it off, man. It's like I think uh, looking back, he probably knew already who I was, which to me was really weird because that's not a concept that I uh, could fathom, specifically back then. But looking back at it now and the records that I had released and the name that I had name, my name that I had already put on records, he probably did know who I was and gave me uh, respect. We exchanged records uh, and a friendship was born, a friendship based on, yeah, I guess, I guess sort of like that common sort of idea, like we're going to fucking change the world. And, and, and uh, I became a part of his agency and well, you can, you can continue and ask for, but this is around 99. No, this is perfect. Yeah. Um, and I went in the studio and I made my lexicon. <laughs> and you worked in his studio, you said? No. And then I went into, into uh, the oh, studio I and I made studio. my lexicon. Yeah. And I remember when I had my lexicon finished at nine in the morning, there was a little guy, an intern that came in uh, from, uh, from, for, for, you know, for his day of work. And he opened the, the door to the, to the record label that was next to the studio. And uh, I told him, like, dude, c come on in. You have to listen to this record. And, and I sat him down and I played in the record. And he was like, fuck, dude, fucking insane. But he was kind of going like, what, is he still awake? Or what the fuck is wrong? It's like nine in the morning. What's wrong? I was like, yeah, I haven't slept, man. I haven't slept for three days. You fucking sit down. You have to listen to this, to this tune. And that ended up uh, being Jorn Heringa, the guy that I played this record to. And Jorn is now arguably the biggest a &R in the world for dance music, who, you know, discovered and uh, Martin Garrix and, and all these people. So every time we speak, he works for um, uh, Spinning Records. So every time we speak, I'm like, you remember that time? He's like, you were the first one in the world to hear my lexicon at nine in the morning on some random Tuesday. And look where you are now, so pay me. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think anybody, you know, goes into the studio and is is like, well, no, Ga no Gallagher actually said this when he wrote some might say about or for Oasis, but I don't think you go into the studio and you're like, I'm about to make a defining song of this generation of music. But do you did you have like some good momentum from, you know, bringing in Sasha? Were you coming in with good energy? Like I'm I'm maybe more so at the center of this than I've ever been. I think to be honest, it's it's. it's I'm so f I'm further down the in life now, so I can look back at the rhythm of things and why things uh, tend to happen more at certain specific times than others. And I truly believe that that 
um, creating some sort of like creative um, highlight or some reaching some creative peak uh, is really hard to define within the moment because you are literally building. You can look back and go like, okay, so my lexicon probably started in 96, you know, you can kind of go like, okay, so you had a little taste of like something exciting and you were hungry to sort of try and repeat this. You were looking for inspiration. Um, I called it my lexicon because I live in the Netherlands. It's not like I, I can find some incredible singers that come into the studio and, and give me like a performance of a lifetime. It's not like Madonna will likely, you know, be, be born in the Netherlands. No, you, you got to be in a place like New York. So my lexicon is my way of expressing myself, my, my words, my emotions put in, into that record. And uh, I mean, it's like, I don't know, the, 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 the studio was tuned to make that record as well. Like everything was like, you got to understand like back then you, you, you would have an analog setup, um, which is not, you can't recall like an analog setup. It's just like, that's there for that moment and for that record. And you have to keep it there for like uh, a few days to finish the record. Cause if you go and work on something else that is gone. So. You have to keep like all the settings pretty constant throughout the session Sorry? you have to keep like the dials and the settings constant no it's analog i mean it's analog it's like it's there it's like you have to i mean this whole record was like me as a crazy man like running around in the, in 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 the studio and tweaking the knobs and opening the filter of the melody and that this was all like uh in that moment it was no like pre-call i mean you could allocate some sort of digital information or midi uh, information to some of your filters and you can allegate um but you can't like you know it was it was a lot of it had to be done manually you know yeah i'd had to if i had a uh, a stereo out on the on the sampler and 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 six mono outs i made the stereo out left and right so i had an extra you know uh, channel of, of noise that i could i could add so it's like it was all like fine tuning um um your environment uh, by hand. It's hard. It's crafty work. It's like you know, setting the compressors where you want them to be. And I think it was. It was just. just it was just. It was just like I guess the end of a, of a few years of experimenting and trying and doing and da da da. And then it happened. And yeah, I mean, I was extremely excited by that euphoric moment when the chord change uh, and that baseline adds uh, somewhere halfway the record. But. Um, but yeah, it's like I don't know, it's like mathematics, you know. It's like I don't know. It's like yeah, it just it just just clicked. The energy just yeah, just clicked. And I knew it was special. I didn't know it was like a fucking you know. You never really know it was you know uh, what it ended up becoming for me. You know. Definitely. Um, was it cool for you to not only have like a track featured on Global Underground, but to be one of the rare people to have two tracks featured and realize you're making up, you know, one sixth of what pe some people consider to be like one of the greatest mixed CDs ever. Yeah, no, that's a horrible feeling. <laughs> no, no, I mean, listen, it's, 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 it's such a two faced in all honesty, it's such a two faced, um, uh, situation you know, you hit some sort of creative peak and you kind of go like okay well i mean where the fuck do i go from here it's like the most relevant dj in the world uh has just used two of your records on the most relevant and most look looked forward to compilation uh, of the year it will probably you know give me a shitload of work and and rec recognition uh, and what I, what I did was like i guess is i wrote the fucking wave you know as as good as i could and uh I mean, where later in life, you know, some people uh, or later on in, in, in the course of the development of, of, of EDM and electronic music, some people that, that something like this had happened to ended up becoming in, um, ended up in places where they were not in control anymore of their destination and they were not in control or felt they had the idea that they were in control of who they were or whatever. I mean, look at Avicii who arguably was also somebody who was just like woof, catapulted into, into this thing that he, you know, um, didn't really particularly enjoyed. Um, and I, 
I can fairly say that I was catapulted into something I fairly enjoyed, um, but I'm not going to lie that at some point it also became quite quite a burden to 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 ride that wave and to be known for that sort of guy that like was friends of Sasha and fucking like that's it, you know. So and the self destruct mode that I uh, that I button that I pushed at some point a couple of years later had to do with that uh, you know the sort of idea like oh my god i'm now trapped into this thing uh and i can't like i cannot be the one that is going to try and and you know find new tricks or new moves or wear a new t-shirt on the on the on the on the on the, on the, on the uh, uh in the skate ramp <laughs> by lack of a better a better uh, um uh, comparison uh was quite kind of suffocating because it also kind of means like okay so this is most likely the end of my creative i mean that's a bit dramatic but it like felt like that like it was a, sort of like trapped into being that guy that that would end up forever making that that type of record and end up forever you know mixing those type types of mixing uh, mixes but although i mean in all honesty i enjoyed those years tremendously um but i was hungry for new um, um you know challenges I think you have a very unique experience that I wonder about so many DJs. It's it's like you have a big group of fans that truly loved your love your music, but they don't they don't want you to change outside of that because they love they love that sound and you're so good at creating, you know, a sound that they love. So when but you're also an artist and you can't be boxed in to something is that is that kind of, does that inspire you or is that more of a conflict in your career? No, it's not a conflict. I think, I think you have to understand that you create uh, soundtracks for people's lives and then, then those soundtracks define their finest moments. They define meeting their lover, they define becoming of age or define their first drug experience or the camaraderie that comes with being young, a part of a subculture and, and, again you know maybe under the influence and it's like it's hard to argue with the power of those uh, moments and i am purely blessed to be able to have given these people a soundtrack and have given these people um you know things that they actually also can go back to like you remember that oh, let's listen to that again oh my god like you remember when we drove there when we drove this and when we were young when we were there? you know and th those are inc that's incredible valuable like i feel so blessed to even have been able, and I say this with like the, you know, as humble as I can, to be able to provide that soundtrack to their life is has been the privilege of my life. Uh, honestly, seriously. But the fact of the matter is, is it's not fucking 2001. You know, it's like, and and I know there's a bunch of kids out there that just repeat what they do all over, over and over and again. And I guess if you ask the Rolling Stones, like, why are you still doing what you're doing? They probably go like, well, I have seven wives, you know, and and whatever. So there's a bunch of reasons to stay in that thing, but being creative is not one of them. And staying creative or inspired is also not one of them. It's like you're. When you're young, you build something with Lego or you build something with with whatever. And then when it's done, you kind of go like, well, fuck this. I can build something new. And I guess I'm still the boy playing with Lego. And it's like <laughs> my Lego was was getting kind of big, but I still broke. You know, I still try to tear it down to a certain part and then sort of rebuild or 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 add elements to it that, it, that you know, kept me inspired. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your perspective on that, because it's a. Uh... It's just really interesting. Um, and thank you for being so open. I want to I wanna ask you something about this album. I'm not sure if you can see it. It's the new breed. Um, so I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not in pajamas, I swear. I'm actually, if you can see, wearing I'm looking the at outfit. The I'm wearing the Techno Monk outfit that you wore on the cover. <laughs> I wish, I wish I, yeah. I'm... It's, it's so, so cool to me. So we talked to Anthony Papa about the new breed. New breed sounded so cool to me. Next generation of superstar DJs at the forefront of the underground sound. Maybe not so much the journey you wanted to bring uh, your listeners on, but it's, it's a series based around a new sound and saying something new. Did you go in wanting to say something with your music or what was your mindset going into this mix? Uh, you want the honest truth? Uh, 
You can lie to us first and then we'll get the honest truth. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to do a city. Like I, I really wanted to be a part of the city series because I mean, and to me, this was like, okay, whatever dudes, like I'll do this one just as long as, <laughs> as yeah. I can end up doing a, a city, you know, because the city was the Holy grail. That was it. Like you were, you know, uh, it was like it was like I don't know. It was like a Sports Illustrated fucking cover. You know what I mean? It's like this is it. This is like the 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 yeah. It's just like I don't know the biggest thing you could achieve as a DJ back then. And um, so this came along and it and it was cool and I loved it and I loved doing these um, uh, doing this mix. Um, I, but I mean, did I go in? I mean, I just wanted to represent myself in the best, best, best possible way. You know what I mean? It's like. It was not as it was not as intense as uh, doing the essential mix um, that year, which I did as well. Which is kind of was kind of conflicting because it's like every mix you wanted to be special and you didn't want to sort of like get one record mixed into the other. So this whole period was like it was there was some sort of battle going on between the essential mix in two thousand and one, which I, if looking back, is probably one of my favorite the, one of my favorite mixes I've ever done. Uh, and a huge honor as well to me, like if we're talking about these like four moments of like biggest things you've ever you know achieved then the, the, you do me wrong on Swigger Rhythm doing an essential mix um, was definitely uh, in that top four as well um, so um, what's there to say I don't know it was it was hard man I, I remember it was hard it was hard to fight for the exclusives it was such a battle to get like breeder or any any of these producers to sort of like allocate you with like an exclusive or or try to get your hands on something like that you knew there were like only two or three records from and i think that whole era as well and i think it's it's very important to 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 state that here i think what set us all so apart from the rest of um, the djs was the fact that we were a part of like the dominant DJ sound or the, the you know, the, the most hyped sound, but we were also a very tight knit group of producers uh, and DJs that would hand each other like the hottest records and we would play each other's hottest records way before they were going out. So you knew, you know, you're going to go to a, a Sasha gig, you're going to hear like 10 records that are not going to come out for the next whatever year. You go to a Sanders uh, DJ set, you will hear that instrumental Chemical Brothers remix or instrumental Madonna remix that Sasha only gave to Sander because, you know, whatever friends and he asked for it. So all that sort of like exclusivity and the, the fact that you knew like you, you were going somewhere where the sound was unique to that moment, to that moment in time, wherever we were at that time in the world was such a, a, an important element um, to the experience of, of, of go and check, going and check, checking us out. Not only because we individually were who we were, but we were also a fucking collective uh, bunch of producers and DJs, you know, connected through this, through this sound and through this, through this hype. And um, I think with the rise of digital, um, you know, digital dis distribution, um, the first mp3s floating around you know slowly and then deep you know cd mixing became you know so 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 content was easier to you know go places i think that really demystified some of the, some of that some of that legendary sort of like uh 10 hours in twilo heard records i've never heard again and never will hear again that that that's just um yeah, that, that, that was all a part of the mystique back back then so doing this mix it was also uh, you know battling for like you know, who's, who's doing one, you know, oh, yeah, Nick, Warren. <laughs> Nick Warren is doing Budapest or, you know, it's like so and such is free working his, is, uh, you know, and you, you'd be on the, on the phone with the producer go like, dude, do you think the record, I can get the record exclusive? No, no, Nick, Nick still got it on the short list, man. I, you know, he, you know how it is. It's like that type of stuff. Um, yeah, it was all part of the hustle and the sort of like the energy and the sort of like, I think uh, yeah, New York FM like that record was you know it was I don't, do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? It's like yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and and so when the record came out, you wanted it to be filled with like fresh, fresh fucking produce. You know, you wanted it to be like fuck. This is like you know, or you you had to choose like something that everybody forgot about or looked um, um, not looked at or you know, which was also which which was also obviously. Uh, so yeah, it was it was quite an intense sort of like. Um... Yeah, it's taking the 
forefront to the limit almost. It's like absolutely, hundred percent, like hundred. We make this. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, but I also, but I also well, think this, this, this sort of almost anal sort of like analytical sort of approach. Um, it it also destroyed some of the uh, freedom of house music because it became quite technical and it became quite broish. A lot of girls like, yeah, well, I mean, you know, John Digweed, okay, whatever. And it, it is like John Digweed was like a bunch of guys going, oh my God, John Digweed. Because they, uh, a lot, I'm, not, I'm not saying that girls are not into whatever that culture, but back then it was like a predominantly a male thing. And they would go wild on the details of like, okay, you know, he's now he's now playing this record and like, he's the only one who has that copy. But a girl would go like, well, fuck you. I just want to get fucked tonight or like drink drink something. And when, <laughs> when are you going to take me from this place and go somewhere, somewhere fancy? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So it's like, okay. it kind of took away, it kind of took away the, the, uh, the celebrational aspect of house music, um, which also ended up giving me the idea, like, I'm not, too sure I want to maintain a part of this bro culture where it's like who's got the hottest and the fattest and the this and the that and I wanted to take it uh, away and put it back into fun and club and sexy and women and and then I made the fruit (laughs) (laughs) yeah I think one thing I'm here it sounds like at that moment it's the birth of your it's like the in or the out culture or the cool or the uncool culture within house music when you start having fans and everyone's a lot older today, but you still see it like people in comments being like, no, that's lame or wow, that's really cool. But, but you, I definitely even experience it in the groups when I'm learning about this stuff and people will reflect on a track and you'll have people say, no, that's cheese. Like that's, that's whack. But yeah. No. And even like, and that's the thing, like, if you also dare to, and this this is important to understand, like if you dare to go somewhere else musically or creatively, you will that will have an effect on your legacy. It will have an effect on how people perceive what you did before, because it's like, well, I mean, he is doing this now. Can this still be good, or is this like, can I not now not like uh, like this anymore? You know, or and I think I think it's uh, unfortunately for me, like not unfortunately for me, but unfortunately, generally speaking. Uh, I found that to be taken away from what this is all about. And I felt at one point like, okay, this is all getting quite sort of like um, not only technical and like too, um, um, too much oriented on the, like, you know, want to want to be the first or the only just for the sake of being the first and the only instead of like it being effective, you know, or being uh, cool and underground, but not having a euphoric effect anymore on the dance floor. I think that's where Chesto and Armin van Buren and all these people was just like looking at this sound and, and the success of it and went like, OK, well, that's all great. But how is this going to work in a stadium with 10,000 people? And it's like, well. It can only work if there's melody and a, and, a, and a cheesy voice and a this and that and so and such. So let me just take some of the sort of, st- you know, the, 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 the branding and the personality uh, branding um, nods from this scene, but I'm going to mix it with, you know, a little bit more of a commercial approach. Because I think definitely the, the, the way that we've cultivated the, 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 the DJ I think a lot of it was born in that same era, the Sasha, the John, the, the, the maybe, you know, and the, me and the, you know, the, the people that were around at that time. I think the way that we've made the DJ cool, uh, if I can say so, and it's maybe a bit arrogant to say, but I think we, we made the DJ cooler. Um, and, and, you know, and the next generation, uh, you know, ran away with it and made it, made it not only cooler, but also more commercial and like, you know, Definitely. Um, before we move on from this era, like I'm just wondering because tr- location had such a big influence, like on these albums, where would you, you said you wanted a, a city series? Like, I mean, like every DJ wants the GU city series, where would you have gone to like showcase a city's culture? Like what, what would be some places that you'd like to highlight? Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm like a whore. I would have done any city. Like I, I don't know. No, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I may, I, pro- I probably, probably, uh, I may have fantasized about it. I'm not sure if there's a, 
you know, Frankfurt or Paris. I don't, I'm not sure how, how. So, and I obviously moved on pretty quickly to um, starting my own series because I was like, okay, I'm a part of all this and it's cool and dandy, but it kind of creates some hierarchy where it's like, they are the whatever gods that did a city and I'm the one that like did the new breed. And like, I don't know. I mean, it was cool. It was fun, but I felt like I deserved a little more. So I started my own. You know, and I, I basically started my own in everything. Like, uh, I think, yeah, like, I don't know. I felt like there were, there were like also forces in place where like, I don't know, that there was some ceiling, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, this is this is where, where that is. And you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. Um, I think that's like a really honest explanation of all this stuff that people, like I definitely, I wasn't, I was like five when this was all going down, but I romanticized this era totally because I see it like there and I'm like, it'll never be like that again. Like, it's so cool, but we're like getting the real scoop. It's awesome. No, no. And, and again, I don't want to demystify uh, uh, stuff of it because it was, it was incredible. And it, like I said, it gave me such an incredible uh, ride and, and, and the, you know, it was, it was, it was an amazing ticket. So, and um, I would never look back in anger, but, the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, yeah, not too late after I, you know, I thought it was time to move on. Yeah. I just want to ask you kind of like bringing it into the present and everything. I just have some questions for you about your experience. You travel a lot. It's, it's really cool. I love checking in on your Instagrams. You're like going to all these cool places. You have a really cool, fun lifestyle. As we were talking about earlier, one of my favorite things, um, about house music is that there are cities and cultures that you can go and experience that are totally different from where we're from. And like house music means um, a totally different thing to that culture than it means here. So I was wondering if like you would could just share like maybe one or two cities you recommend traveling to that has a really unique house music culture to go experience because coming out of this pandemic, you know, next summer, like I know I am, my friends are, everyone's excited to go see the world again and go experience life. And, and um, we're coming out of the pandemic with now this whole new appreciation of house music history. So like, where are some of the cities where it's like the hottest or where it's just the coolest to go experience? I mean, to, to be honest, I, I've had, like you said, I've, I've you know, this, this thing is, has, I've traveled the, 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 the seven seas, as they say. And, um, and, and the fact of the matter uh, is that house music has fulfilled its promise to me where on that floor, uh, religion, race, culture, sexual preference uh, has no place. It is literally uh, where we are one. And um, if you go to Lahore in Pakistan, which I think I was one of the first DJs ever to, to DJ there, which is a bit weird because you're like, surrounded with uh with with let's just say a fairly strict form uh yeah. of um of islam and uh and you go there and you to be honest like i in in islamic countries djing house music is such a it has been such such a great uh experience for me because there is no message in house music um that has any references to any religion so it's really um like islamic culture itself where there's no image of a god or you know it's all quite abstract um and there's no image of a of, a, of people or, or you know they're they're all like abstract images of of they claim or think you know to the only one that can see uh or project is God himself. So we can try to duplicate his creation, which is incredible, but house music is, you know, quite abstract as well. So they feel a certain freedom, I guess, to fully indulge in, into, into, into the, into the vibe. And, um, and yeah, so I've had, I've had a really incredible, you know, from Beirut to uh, Cairo to um, Damascus, like crazy. Like, I mean, if I think about it and um, yeah, so, so I've got some really great uh, experiences there and, and a real love for the Middle East. Like it's a, it's a, it's just such a beautiful uh, place and also a culture that um, is, there's still so much to d discover 
almost uh, and 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 a birth ground for for a lot of things in 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 the West. And people don't seem to fully grasp the importance of um, of that culture. Um, but yeah, so that's really great. And then. I don't know. I mean, you know, America, it's, it's not the America you see on TV. You know, you travel and DJ in America and it's like, I don't know. I've had the loveliest experience, loveliest experiences in places like Texas, where you would say, okay, well, you go to Texas, that's where it's like redneck and, and, and right wing and whatever and Trump country. And that, it's just like a totally opposite of what I uh, was lucky enough to experience. And, uh, you know, I mean, recommend going places yeah i mean argentina when it comes to nightlife and the energy and the i don't know it's unparalleled there's no there's just no place like it that's what everyone tells us every, every dj we've talked to it's all no it's just so interesting like I, it's the on top of my list to go to the first the first gig i ever had there it was like uh this, is, this guy called martin Contet. he used to manage uh hernan cataneo and he's like a legend there and, <clears throat> and one of the first promoters bringing in international talent. So in 2001, I go and DJ at Pasha a club next to the, to the river. And, uh, I go, I go there, I land. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm so happy to be here. Everybody's very excited and, um, very excited to see you. And I'm like, well, okay, great. Like, you know, I obviously 2001 internet was, you know, so, so, and, I'm like okay, cool. It's like one o'clock in the morning. I'm at. I'm at. He's like, how? What time do you want to go on? And I'm like, I don't know. Like one. He's like, no, 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 not one. It's too early. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, one thirty. Like, no, 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 too early. Like, like, like two. And they're like, no, 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 no. You go on at two thirty. I'm like, okay, but dude, but no. I think he even said like, you go on at three. And then I probably said like, no, I was. I want to be there at two. I go there at two. There's no one in the club. I'm like, fuck. I flew all the way down from end of the world flew to the end of the world to dj and there's no one here i'm sh i'm sure this is why he said you can't go on at one because didn't sell any tickets one hour later this fucking place is like jumping up and down. it's like fucking mayhem i have never in my life been in a place where it's more crazy than 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 this place it was just the energy was just like you could literally make a sandwich of that energy and you'd be like no sleep for 10 years. It was insane. It was fucking insane. And um, yeah, <laughs> so with, within the two, between two and three o'clock, everybody's just like whoop, to the club because, you know, they had finished their steak dinner and, you know, <laughs> and man, it's a really good place. It's a great place. It's so funny because I want to thank you. Like you show us so much, you show us love on our Instagram when we post about you and it's super cool. We made this random post about Hernan Contineo and we didn't know so much like we are pretty like in the GU phase of us posting and he didn't have a GU. So it is by far and away our most like post and the likes just were pouring in from Argentina. And it like hit me at that. I mean, it's dumb that it takes something like that to open your eyes. But I was like, wow, it's really, really, really different down there. A hundred percent. I mean, and Hernan is like a. Yeah, he's the king of South America. I mean, there's there's no one like him. He, yeah, apart from being an amazing DJ, he's just like, yeah, he's the, the loveliest guy. And and those memories that I that I was lucky enough to uh, to make there are gonna last a, a lifetime for sure. I think um, I think we'll wrap this up. And the last thing I want to I want to talk to you about is, um, it's cool when you see a lot of times like DJs who gained popularity in this era and you've maintained like popularity throughout, but um, a lot of them like are older and don't necessarily uh, embrace like how immersive social media can allow us to be with our fans. I think like your vlog that you do with your fiance, you're getting married in two weeks are such like a cool insight into the life of what a superstar DJ looks like. And I never thought that I'd find it via a vlog, but I'm wondering as if like you've played some of the craziest clubs in the world and like have been in some of the most crazy DJ booths, but I'm sure you also get nervous when like something for the vlog has to come out. Like I just watched the one about your engagement and it was just really funny to see like a different side of you. It's cool. Yeah, no, I'm for sure. I I think, you know, I guess, you know, being creative or at least longing to be um, at the forefront of, of, 
of development and ideas this this i mean it's not something you specifically look for it's not like i listened to the radio in 88 and went like okay and now this is going to make me this but sometimes i just have this like urge to to be a part of something you know and 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 i think with the with the birth of the social influencer there were so many parallels uh with the birth of the dj like the the rhythm of it the sort of di disruptive nature of it the sort of like people saying nah this is never going to work this is never going to be a, you know into becoming a billion dollar industry in the last 10 years it's just been like i don't know it's just been really really exciting to be a part of um and building a business businesses with uh, and even all the sort of rhythm that i've learned um of how to um have that path in, in 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 DJ culture and 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 made it into you know what it is today and and playing my role in it. Um, it kind of feels the same like with with this. I spoke to Arash, he's Dubfire's brother, and he was like, it's it's and it's, I'm not saying this, but it's but it's a good comparison. He's like, you 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 were part of something twice. That's like fucking that's pretty cool because like you you were there when it's like this DJ thing. And then everybody looked at me 10 years ago when I, when I became that sort of Instagram husband type dude. And it's like, everybody was laughing. It's like, why the fuck is Sander like, you know, doing this, 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 you know, this thing. And now it's like Louis Vuitton is calling and going like, so how are we going to, you know? And it's like, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I don't know. You know, it's just, I like to be part in the end of the day, I like to be part of culture. Um, I don't know. I, I, and, 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 and it gives me energy um, and I want to be involved in it and I want to be inspired by it. It keeps me young. It keeps me excited. Uh, keeps me off the streets. Uh, it's what I do. I like yeah. to represent it. Dude, it's cool. Like we have the same experience. I mean, like we spend all of our time on this project, but just something completely unrelated. We started a vegan cooking TikTok. And for like two weeks, we were almost like, wow, this is actually like, we thought it was the house music thing, but the t vegan TikTok is actually where it's at. And it's just cool, like getting energy from different places in your life uh, to like keep you inspired and just keep you like on and like feeling good. No, 100%. And also I think, I think the, you know, a creative of tomorrow cannot afford him or herself to be just focused on on one element i think i think um you could you could do 12 things and then the one thing makes money but the but the other thing is good for the soul and then and then the other thing is good for the inspiration and so yeah you need to be diverse man i, th I feel at least that's where i feel i belong i i i admire somebody like diplo who who um has become so successful with such a diversified uh, portfolio you know with all these different elements that he did and all these different ideas and his and his social media and it's like that's like the, you know the that's like a blueprint of the new star you know the, the 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 new star that uses all of the elements of and all of the radars radars that are at his or her disposal and um yeah it's it's cool it's cool to be uh to be in that world in in in, in all these different capacities yeah well Sonder, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. This is like, you know, hour and a half now. It's like really awesome just to be able to hear your stories, pick your brain and learn from you like all about what dance music's all about. So thank you very much. Um, have a blast at your wedding. That sounds amazing. I hope you have a good time. I hope it all goes well. And uh, good luck with these last two weeks of preparation. Thank you, brother. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's awesome. Thanks. See you when, uh, when I'm out there in L.A.